Yeah, so this talk is that uh, it's not actually that scary. It just has some unusual things, some flickering moments, uh, a few unsettling pictures. Nothing graphic, nothing where you'll be looking at it and you'll say, like, wow, this is disturbing, I, and I know why it's disturbing. Uh, no, it's, it'll be more like, I don't know why, but this looks, this is weird to me. And we'll be asking why. Um, and we'll also be talking about some things, some of the kinds of things that we don't usually talk about. And all sorts of stuff kind of wants to pour down river when you open locks like that. And so I want you to be here for it. But if you can't be here for it, then take care of yourselves. Otherwise, hello, my name is Ashi. And today, I want to talk with you about a hobby. I want to share some of the things that I've learned at the intersection of computational neuroscience and machine learning. For years, I've been fascinated by how we think, how we perceive, how the machinery of our bodies results in qualitative experiences, and why we have the kinds of experiences we do, why they're shaped like this and not like that, why we suffer. For years, I've also been fascinated by AI, and I think we all have. We're watching these machines begin to approximate the tasks of our cognition, sometimes in unsettling ways. And so today, I want to share with you some of what I've learned. Some of it is solid research. Some of it is solid speculation. And all of it speaks to a truth that I have come to believe, which is that we are computations. Our world's created on an ancient computer, powerful beyond imagining. So let's begin. Part one. Hallucinations. This person is Miguel Pereo Nieto, and he has something to show us. <clears throat> it starts with these simple patterns, these splashes of light and dark, kind of like images from the first eyes. These give way to lines and colors, and then curves and more complex shapes. What's happening is that we are diving through the layers of the Inception image classifier. And it seems that there are whole worlds in here. Shaded, multichromatic hatches, the crystalline farm fields of an alien world, the cells of plants. To understand where these visuals are coming from, let's take a look inside. The job of an image classifier is to reshape its input which is a square of pixels, into its output, which is a probability distribution. So the probability that this image is of a cat, the probability of a dog, a person, a banana, a toaster. It performs this reshaping through a series of convolutional filters. Now, convolutional filters are basically Photoshop filters. Each neuron in a convolutional layer has a receptive field, some small patch of the previous layer that it's looking at. And each convolutional layer applies a filter. Specifically, it applies an image kernel. A kernel is a matrix of numbers, where each number represents the weight of the corresponding input neuron. So each pixel in a neuron's receptive field is multiplied by its weight, and then we sum all of them to produce the output neuron's value. We apply that same filter across every neuron in a layer, and the values in that filter are learned during training. So we feed the classifier a labeled image, that's something where we know what's in it. It outputs predictions, and then we math to figure out how wrong those predictions were. And then we math again to figure out how to change the values in this filter to produce a better result. So the term for that is gradient descent. The deep dream process, which is what's creating these visuals, inverts that. So this visualization is recursive. To compute the next frame, we feed the, previous, uh, we we feed the current frame into the network. We run it through the network's many layers until we find the layer that we're interested in. And then we math. What could we do to the input layer to make that layer activate more? And then we adjust the input image in that direction. So the term for this process is gradient ascent. Finally, we scale the image up very slightly before feeding it back into the network for the next frame. 
that kind of keeps the network from fixating on the same details in the same places, and it also creates this really wild zooming effect. Every 100 frames or so, we move to a deeper layer, or a layer that's off to the side. Um, Inception has a whole lot of layers, and they're not all arranged in a neat linear stack. <coughs> and that gives us this. So we started with these rudiments of light and shadow, and now, down here, we kind of have a city of Kodamas situation happening. But then we're about to enter the spider observation area in which spiders observe you. But it's okay, because soon the spiders will become corgis. And the corgis are going to become the 70s. Later, we've got this uh, space of nearly human eyes which will transform into dog slugs and then dog bird slugs. Deeper, unfortunately, we had a saxophonist teleporter accident. And finally, the flesh zones with a side of lizard. <clears throat> so, when I first saw this, I was like, should I tell the story? I'm going to tell the story. When I first saw this, I, I thought it looked like nothing so much as US President Donald Trump. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I resolved to never tell anyone that, certainly not on stage, until my best friend was watching the same video. And she said, you know, this, this just kind of reminds me of... <laughs> and I think that actually says more about the state of our neural networks than this one. Um, I, I think the lizard juxtaposition has something to do with it. But I do want you to notice and think about what it means that all of the flesh in this network is so very pale. <clears throat> so, this is pretty trippy. <laughs> yeah. Why is that? What does it mean for something to be trippy? To figure that out, let's take a look inside ourselves. Meet Scully. Scully doesn't need all this cruft. We're just looking at Scully's visual system, which starts here, in the retina. Now, Scully's retina, your retina, our retinas, they're actually pretty weird. Light comes into them, and it immediately hits a membrane. There's a layer of ganglions, which are not actually particularly photoreceptive, that they are a little. Uh, then there's a layer of more stuff that does important things, presumably. And at the back are the photoreceptors, the rods and cones, which sense uh, luminance and color. So when light comes in, it has to go through these four layers of tissue, hit a photoreceptor. That photoreceptor is going to get excited. It'll send out a signal to its ganglions, which then have to send it to the brain somehow through the optic nerve, which is drilled through the center of your eye, which means the, sen the sensors in our eyes are mounted backwards, and there's a hole in the center of them, and it's all okay because we patch it up later in software. There's a couple of other problems with our eyes, too. One, we have about 120 million photoreceptors, and there's 10 times fewer ganglions than that, so it can't be a one-to-one -one mapping. And two, the bandwidth of our optic nerve is 10 megabits, which is not you know, like a lot. I don't know when the last time you tried to watch video over a 10 megabit connection is, but it's much slower than Wi-Fi. Our cameras are about 100 megapixels. It's not going to work. And so our retinas do what you would do if you were given those design constraints. They compress the data. Each ganglion is connected to a receptive field. That's 100 or so photoreceptors. That, is, that are divided into a central disk and a surrounding region. So when there's no light on any of them, the ganglion doesn't fire. When the whole field is illuminated, the ganglion fires very weakly. When only the surround is illuminated and the center is dark, half the ganglions in your retina fire really s strongly, and the other half don't fire at all in the same situation. But those ganglions behave the opposite way. They fire when the center is bright and the surround is dark. So these different species of ganglions, they're not actually different species, they're just ganglions that naturally behave this way. They're scattered, um, they're distributed evenly throughout your retina. And if you think about what this does, 
creates an edge detection filter. So we're doing processing even in our eyeballs in order to downsample the image coming in from our photoreceptors a hundred times while retaining vitally important information, namely where the boundaries of objects are. Okay, so then the signal is going to go into the brain. It's going to hit the optic chiasma, where the data streams from our left and right eyes cross, where we extract stereo vision. It's going to get processed by the thalamus, which is a switching center for all kinds of signals in your brain. Uh, it's responsible, amongst other things, for running our eyes autofocus. Each step in the signal pathway is doing a little bit of processing. We're extracting a little bit of information. And that's all before we even get to here, the visual cortex, all the way around back. Our visual cortex is arranged into a stack of neuronal layers. The signal stays actually pretty spatially coherent throughout the visual cortex. So there's some slice of tissue in the back of your brain that's responsible for pulling faces out of this particular chunk of your visual field. I mean, more or less. Your brain is very squishy. <clears throat> Each neuron in a layer of our visual cortex has a receptive field, some chunk of the entire visual field that it's looking at. And neurons in a given layer tend to respond to um, signals in the same way. And that operation, distributed over a layer of neurons, it extracts features from the visual signal. Early layers extract simple features, like lines and curves and edges. And then later layers extract more complex ones, like gradients and surfaces and objects, eyes, faces, and movement. It's no accident that we see very similar behavior in Inception, because convolutional neural networks like Inception were inspired by the design of our visual cortex. Of course, our visual cortex is different from Inception in many ways. Inception is a straight shot through. It has branches, but no cycles. <clears throat> our visual cortex contains feedback loops these pyramidal neurons that connect deeper layers to earlier ones. Those feedback loops allow the results of deeper layers to inform the behavior of earlier layers. So we might turn up the gain for edge detection along the edge of what is later detected to be an object. This lets our visual system adapt and focus, not optically, but attentionally. It gives us the ability to ruminate on visual input, well before we become consciously aware of it, improving our predictions over time. You know this feeling, I think. You think you see one thing, and then you realize it's something else. And these loopback pyramidal cells in our visual cortex are covered in serotonin receptors. And different kinds of pyramidal cells respond to serotonin differently, but generally, they find it exciting. And don't we all? You might be familiar with serotonin in its starring role as the target of typical antidepressants, which are serotonin reuptake inhibitors. When serotonin gets released into your brain, they make it stick around longer, thereby treating depression. Some side effects may occur. Most serotonin in your body is actually located in your gut, where it controls bowel movement. It signals to your gut that it's got food in it, and it should go on and do whatever it does to food. And that seems to be what the molecule signals throughout your body, resource availability. And for animals like us with complex societies, resources can be very abstract, social resources as well as energetic ones. That your pyramidal cells respond excitedly to um, serotonin suggests that we focus on that which we believe will nourish us. Now, it's not correct as a blanket statement to say that pyramidal cells are excited by serotonin. There are different kinds of serotonin receptors, and their binding produces different effects. So 5-HT1A receptors tend to be inhibitory, somewhat drowsiness-inducing. 5-HT3 receptors, in the brain, they're associated with sensations of queasiness and anxiety, and in the gut, they make it run backwards. So anti-nausea drugs are frequently 5-HT3 antagonists. There is another serotonin receptor, one that the pyramidal cells in your visual cortex find particularly exciting. This is the 5-HT2A receptor. This is the primary target of every known psychedelic drug, 
This is what enables our brains to create psychedelic experiences. So you go to a show, and you eat a little piece of paper, and that piece of paper makes its way down into your stomach, where it dissolves, releasing molecules of lysergic acid diethylamide into your gut. Now, LSD doesn't bind to 5-HT3 receptors particularly, so if you feel butterflies in your stomach, it's likely just because you're excited, because you know what's going to happen. And what's going to happen is this. LSD will diffuse into your blood. It has no trouble crossing the blood-brain barrier, because it's tiny but powerful, like you. It will diffuse deep into your brain, into your visual cortex, where it finds a pyramidal 5-HT2A receptor and locks into place. It will stay bound there for around 221 minutes. That's four hours, which is a very long time. They think that a couple of proteins snap into place and form a lid over top of the receptor, trapping LSD inside, which would help explain why it's so very potent, with typical doses about 1,000 times less than most other drugs. So while it's rattling around in there, the little molecule of LSD is stimulating a feedback loop in your visual cortex. It's sending the signal, pay attention. What you're looking at may be nourishing. The pattern-finding machinery in your brain then starts to run over time and at different rates. In one moment, the pattern in a tapestry seems to extend into the world beyond it. In the next, it's the trees that are growing and breathing, the perception of movement, a visual hypothesis that's been allowed to grow wild. With Deep Dream, we asked what would excite some layer of inception, and then we adjusted the input image in that direction. But there's no comparable gradient ascent process in the biological psychedelic experience. That's because we are not looking at a source image. We're looking at the output of the network. We are the output of the network. The output of your visual cortex is a signal carrying visual perceptions, these like proto-qualia, which will be integrated by other circuits in your brain into your next moment of conscious experience. Inception, poor thing, never gets that far. We never even run it all the way to the classification stage. We never ask what it sees in all this. But we could. We could perform the amplification process on a final result rather than an intermediate one. Maybe we ask, what would it take for you to see this banana as a toaster. Or say, don't these skiers look like a dog? So these are adversarial examples, images that have been tuned to give classifiers frank hallucinations, the confident belief that they're seeing something that just isn't there. And they're not completely wild, these robot delusions. I mean, that sticker does look quite a lot like a toaster, and it's very shiny. And those skiers do kind of look like a dog if you squint. And I mean, there's the head, there's the body. And if you were far away and tired and drunk, you might think that it was a big dog. But you probably wouldn't conclude that it's a big dog. The recurrent properties of our visual cortex, not to mention the whole rest of our brains, mean that our sense of the world is stateful. It's a continuously refined hypothesis whose state is held by the state of our neurons. Laying the groundwork for capsule networks, Sarah Sabor, Nicholas Frost, and Jeffrey Hinton write, a parse tree is carved out of a fixed multi-layer neural network, like a sculpture is carved from rock. Our perceptions are a pr process of continuous refinement, which may point the way towards more robust recognition architectures. Recurrent convolutional neural networks that ruminate upon images, making better classifications, or at least providing some kind of signal that something is off about an input. There are adversarial examples for the human visual system, after all, and we call them optical illusions. And they usually feel pretty weird to look at. In this image, we can feel our sensory impression of the scene flipping between three alternatives, a box, a little box in front of a big one, a box in a corner, and a box missing one. In this Munker illusion, there is something scintillating about the color of the dots, which are all the same and are all brown. <laughs> if we designed convolutional neural networks with recurrence, 
they could exhibit such behavior as well, which maybe doesn't sound like such a good thing on the face of it. Like, let's make our image classifiers vacillating and uncertain and then put them in charge of driving cars around. <clears throat> but we drive cars around. And it's our ability to hem and haw and reconsider our own perceptions at many levels that gives our perceptual system such tremendous robustness. Paradoxically, being able to second-guess ourselves allows us greater confidence in our predictions. We are doing science in every moment, the cells of our brain continuously reconsidering and refining shifting hypotheses about the state of the world. And this gives us the ability to adapt and operate within a pretty extreme range of conditions, even while we're tripping face or while asleep. Two. Dreams. These are not real people. Like the unpeople Monica showed us yesterday, these are the photos of fake celebrities, dreamt up by a generative adversarial network. A pair of networks which are particularly creative. The networks get better through continuous mutual refinement. And it works like this. On one side, we have the creator. This is a deep, deep learning network not unlike Inception, but trained to run in reverse. This network we feed with noise, literally just a bunch of random numbers, and it learns to generate images. But it has no way to learn to play this game. In the technical parlance, it lacks a gradient without another opponent, the adversary. The adversary is an image classifier, again like Inception, but trained to run on only two classes, real and fake. Its job is to distinguish the creator's forgeries from true faces. We feed this network with the ground truth, with actual examples of celebrity faces, and the adversary learns. And then we use those results to train the creator. So if it makes a satisfying forgery, it's doing well. If its forgeries are detected, we back-propagate the failure so that it can learn. I should tell you that the technical names for these networks are the generator and the discriminator. I changed the names because names are important and also meaningless. They don't change the underlying structure of the training methodology, which is a game. These two neural circuits are playing with each other. And competition is inspiring. When we spar, our opponent creates for us the tactical landscape that we must traverse, just as we do the same for them. Together, our movements ruminate on a space of possibilities much larger than any fixed example set. GANs can train remarkably well on relatively small amounts of data, and it seems likely that this kind of adversarial process could be helpful for neural circuits of all kinds. So it's not without its quirks. GANs are not particularly great at global structure. Uh, this is Fallout Cow. It is a cow with an extra body. Just as you may have spent a night walking through a house that is your house, but with many extra rooms. These networks are also not super great at counting. So this monkey has eight eyes, because sometimes science goes too far. Do something for me. Next time you think you're awake, which I think is now, Count your fingers, just to be sure. Go ahead. It would have been awkward if I didn't have five. Now, if you find that you have more or fewer than you expected, please don't wake up just yet. Uh, we're not quite done. Another interesting thing about this training technique is that the generator is being fed noise, a vector of noise, some random point in a very high-dimensional latent space. And so it learns a mapping from this space onto its generation target, in this case, faces. And if we take a point in that space and we just kind of drag it around, we get this. Which is also pretty trippy, no? I mean, this resembles things I've seen, things someone who isn't me has seen on acid. This 
resembles the sorts of things that you may have seen in long-forgotten dreams. Now, I don't have a magic school bus ride to take us on to understand why that is, but I do have a theory. When we see a face, there's a bunch of neurons in our brain that light up and begin resonating the signal that is the feeling of looking at that particular face. Taken together, all of the neurons implicated in face detection produce a vector embedding, some mapping from faces to positions in a high-dimensional space. And so as we drag around the generator's vector here, we are also dragging around our own, which is a novel and kind of unsettling sensation. So that's a wild theory, but it's not totally without neurocognitive precedent. Here we have a rat in a cage. So we've hooked an electrode up to a particular neuron in the rat's brain, and these pink dots are the locations where it's firing. If we speed this whole thing up, then we're going to start to see a pattern emerge. This neuron is a grid cell, so named because the centers of its firing fields produce a triangular grid. Now, there's lots of different grid cells in your brain, each aligning to a different grid, and they collect data from your visual system, from head direction cells, which encode the position of your head. And together, these cells con they construct an encoding of our position in 2D Euclidean space. This operates even in our sleep. If earlier you discovered that you were dreaming and you want to see the end of this talk, but you're having trouble not waking up, Oneronauts recommend spinning around. This detaches your perceived body, the one with 12 fingers and three extra bedrooms, from your physical body, which is lying in bed. <clears throat> this positioning system is something which, on some level, you always knew existed. After all, you know where you are in space. You have a sense of space as you move through it, and it's likely even necessary if we believe that cognition is computation, that our qualitative sense of position has a neurocognitive precursor, some signal in the web that tells us where we're at, in many senses of the word. Part three, sticks and stones. They say you can't tickle yourself because you know it's coming. Specifically, when your brain sends an action command to your muscles, it's called an efference. When an efference is sent, your brain makes a copy. Now, makes a copy sounds so planned, so engineered. Your brain is this big, messy, evolved signal processing mesh. So another way to think of efference copies is as reflections. We take the efference and we send it out to the peripheral nerves, where presumably it's going to make some muscles contract. Meanwhile, from the efferent's copy, we predict how our body's state will change, and we use that to update our brain's model of our body's state. Now, if we didn't do this, then we would have to wait for sense data to come back to tell us what happened. I mean, where is our hand right now? And then we would face the same problem as trying to play a twitchy video game over a crap connection. Signals take about 10 milliseconds to travel from our brain to the periphery and about 10 milliseconds to come back. It's just not that low latency or high bandwidth, our nervous system. And so to enable smooth, coordinated movements, our brain has to make predictions. So life goes on. <clears throat> but in a moment, we have another problem. See, we still receive sense data from our nerves. And if we updated our models again, they would fall out of sync. And so we attenuate this signal and keep the model in sync. This attenuation applies even to our sense of touch when that touch is an expected consequence of our own movement. Now, expected consequence, that's quite a complicated model. And aspects of it are likely distributed throughout our brain. But there is one place that is particularly important in maintaining it, the cerebellum. The cerebellum is very special. It contains half the neurons in our nervous system. All action commands from the brain to the body route through it, and all sensations from the body to the brain as well. It has long been recognized as vitally important to motor coordination. 
like this. People with cerebellar damage have trouble performing this action smoothly. With cerebellar damage, it's, our movements become jerky and laggy. It's theorized that the cerebellum acts as a Smith predictor, our brain's controller for our latency-distant bodies, able to estimate the body's current state, integrate sensory feedback to update that model, and decompose gross action commands generated elsewhere in the brain into a fine-tuned, continuously varying control signal. And once you've evolved it, a thing like that has many uses. There's a growing body of evidence implicating the cerebellum in language, which makes sense. Utterance is a kind of movement. And language, she said, kind of gesticulating, is not limited to utterance. The work of moving words is not so different from the work of moving the body. They are both transformations from the space of internal states, of efferents and ideas, to the space of world coordinates and external sense impressions and back again. And what happens when this predictor encounters a problem, when there is an irreconcilable discontinuity in the model? These are not extremely different. They're both visceral and guttural. They shake our bones. And jokes, too, are shaped like trauma. They're both shatterings, the illuminations of discontinuities, paradoxes, which cannot be and yet are. Things that we must revisit again and again Water smoothing the edges of cutting stone, the machinery of our brains trying to make sense of a world that resists it. These last few months have been very difficult for me. The world is heavy. My heart is heavy. We build cages for kids to die in. We live in drowning cities built by slaves. Meanwhile, I spend my days trying to make numbers into bigger numbers. There are days when I open my email and every subject line is a stone, and I think I should put these all into my dress and walk into the sea. But I don't, because I remind myself, because I remember that I am a process of creation. I am a song singing myself. We are stories telling ourselves, a sea understanding itself, our churning waves creating every moment of exquisite agony and exquisite joy and everything else. It's you. It's all you. You are everything. Everything you have ever seen every place you have ever been, every song you have ever sung, every god you have ever prayed to, every person you have ever loved, and the boundaries between you and them and the sea and the stars are all in your head. Thank you. <laughs>